Hey guys and welcome back to the Coder's Legacy channel. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about thread locks. Okay? Thread locks are a very interesting concept where we, you know, have a system of locks that prevent synchronization problems such as race conditions from occurring. Now, what are synchronization problems? How do they occur? And how do we prevent them? That's all going to be covered in this tutorial. Okay? So without further ado, let's begin. I'm going to go over here to our uh, to our little drawing pad and over here we're going to discuss the you know entire concept of threads and thread locks visually to help you guys understand better okay so here's our variable which is known as a shared resource because it's being shared between multiple threads multiple threads are attempting to modify or read from this resource okay so it's called a shared resource all right, so now we have a thread one and we have a thread two. Now, both of them are attempting to modify this resource. Okay, now this is a problem because if they're simultaneously trying to modify this resource, we could end up running into some problems. Okay, let me explain how that's going to happen. And let me just make one thing clear that if, if multiple threads are just reading from a resource, then it's okay there's no problem. There's no problem that can occur. But if they're attempting to modify it, then there's a problem. So I have some labels over here, some text written. Let me explain that. Thread one is going to plus five into our variable X. Thread two is going to plus 10. Okay. But our possible outputs are not just, you know, the obvious answer. The obvious answer is 25, right? 10 plus 5 plus 10 is 25. But we're also going to get, or actually we might get 15, or we might get 20. How is this possible? Let me explain. So the thing is, memory access isn't very direct. It's not as direct as you might think. T1 cannot just plus 5 directly into this. Okay? What it needs to do is first acquire or fetch, okay? It needs to actually fetch the value of variable X into a kind of local memory, a local cache, a local register, okay? The CPU has a bunch of registers and that's where all the operations take place. And then they get sent back to main memory and stored permanently. So what really happens is that T1 stores the value 10, okay? It fetches the value 10, Okay, then it adds five into this, and then this gets added back in here, and this becomes 15. Okay, it doesn't get added, actually, it gets overwritten, it gets replaced. Okay, so that's how this works. So as long as we're using one thread, that's okay. But when we're using two threads, there's actually a slight problem. Let me explain. So let's say this is at initial value of 10. Okay, now thread one fetches the value, okay, and that's 10. So this is the value 10 in its local cache, okay, and now it plussed five into the local register, okay, but before it got the chance to update the main memory with the value 15, what happened is that T2 requested the variable x, the value of variable x. And so 10, the value 10 got stored in its local register. Okay. And then T1 went and updated the value with the value 15. Okay. Follow, following me so far. So what happens now is that T2 is going to update this value with plus 10. Then it's going to send this value back or in here. And this becomes 20. So you see, we just ended up with the value 20, not 25. Okay. And the same thing is going to happen and we'll end up with 15 if T2 goes first. Okay. Right now, T1 went first and T2 went second. So the final value was basically the one with T2. Okay. T2's value. Okay. If we ended up in an alternate scenario where the value here was 10, T2 went first and stored 20 in here then T1 went second 
and then store it 15, so our final value is actually going to be 15. But what's the correct output? Well, the correct output happens underneath this circumstance, where we fetch the value 10, okay, and we update it so it becomes 15, and then, whoops, then we send it back in here and make this 15. And then, and, and then, and only then, does T2 request the resource, and then it updates it to 25, and then it gets written back in here. This is how we get our correct output. Now, did you notice something? They have to go sequentially. If they don't, if they don't, you know, execute sequentially, which means T1 first, and then only when it's done, then T2, or the other way around, T2 goes first, then T1 goes, only in that scenario do we end up with the correct output. If both of them collide with each other, if both of them are performing concurrently, this actually, you know, creates a problem. And we end up with a, we possibly, possibly end up with uh, incorrect output. Okay, so that's where the concept of locks come in. A lock over here is like this key, and this is a key with a rule. This rule states that only a thread with this key can access and modify the shared resource, and there's only one key, so only one thread can have this at a time. And unless you have this lock, unless you have this key, you cannot do anything to the shared resource. You cannot read from it, you cannot modify it, you can't do anything to it. So this way, if thread 1 has the lock initially, then thread 2, it wants to modify variable x, okay? But it cannot. It cannot even read from it, okay? It can't even read from variable x until thread 1 is done, because it doesn't have the lock. And until thread one is done, it's going to keep hold of the lock. And only when it's done is it going to let go. And only then will it become available to T2. And only then will T2 be able to actually, you know, you know, uh, read and then update the value of X. Okay, so that's the entire concept of thread locks. Okay, so I'm going to show you basically, I'm going to show you this, how it works. I'll show you the code now. Let's move over there and we'll take a look at a small implementation. Now, just one thing I want to make clear, it's actually a bit difficult to show you a real-life implementation. It's, a real, it's difficult to show you a real-life implementation of a race condition because these only occur when th there's a lot of heavy operations taking place simultaneously. But I do have this code snippet for you guys to try out. It doesn't work on for me anymore because uh, I recently got a new device and this doesn't trigger a race condition anymore, maybe because my new device is actually a lot better. So this only actually occurred on my old old laptop. So you guys can try this code out. And if you end up with zero, that's the correct answer. If you end up with a value that's not zero, then a race condition has occurred. Okay. And this code is pretty self-explanatory. You should understand it. Okay. So I'll leave this a link to this in my website, sorry, in the description below to, to my website, and you can actually copy paste it from there. Okay. And do let me know in the comment section, whether you guys ran into any race conditions or not. Okay. Because on, on my old laptop, I would get values like minus 5,000 or, or 10,000 or 20,000. And that's obviously incorrect, right? Okay. Anyways, so back to our code here. So we have some very standard code here. We have two threads and each of them are triggering one function and they're empty right now because I haven't done any anything yet. So let's get started. So let's say that they're trying to execute some task, okay? And I want this task to take some time. So I'm just going to put it to sleep for two seconds. Some heavy operation is happening to shared resource, okay? And we'll copy paste the same thing in function one. And what I'm gonna do is use some useful print statements here, okay? Function, actually thread one is acquiring the lock, okay? Uh, Cause I'm gonna imp implement the locks here any minute. 
or actually let's go ahead and do that first. I'm going to create a lock object here. Okay. This is how you create a lock. That's it. No fancy parameters, nothing. You just create the lock here. Okay. And now you just do lock dot acquire. And this is very self explanatory. It means you're attempting to acquire the lock. If no one else is using the lock, you will get the lock and anyone else who comes afterwards will have to wait until you release that lock with the release function. Okay. So this is the operation that's happening. The critical section, as you call it, the code between these two calls is known as the critical section where you put the code that you're performing on the shared resource. Okay. So I'm just going to put in a few print statements here that will help us understand the output later on. Thread one acquired the lock and thread one has released the lock. Okay. And I'm just going to copy paste the same code here. It's mostly the same thing, just changing the names. Okay. And now I'm going to run the code because there's something I want to show you guys in the output. Okay. Hold on. The output is kind of screwed right now. And, uh, that's because of a slight problem with the print statement there. It's a bit incompatible with multiple threads. So there's actually this alternate version that you can write yourself. Let me just pick it up from somewhere. I have it here somewhere. Yeah, there. Okay, cool. So I'm going to overwrite our standard print function with this special function over here. Okay. STD, STD out dot write. It's a lot better way of doing this. And if you just override the print function, you don't need to replace all your print calls. Okay. Cause writing this out is a bit weird, right? Uh, but the print function is, you know, a more handy way of doing it. And using this technique, you, you can just overwrite all your print calls. So now when I do this, we'll get the correct output. Okay. See no more new line problems. And let me do that again. Observe carefully. Thread one is acquiring the lock. Thread one has acquired the lock. Thread two is acquiring the lock, but it cannot because thread one has currently acquired it. Okay. By acquiring, I actually mean it is waiting for the lock. Okay. Thread one acquired the lock immediately because no one else was using the lock, but thread two had to wait for it until thread one could finish. Only then could thread two acquire and then release the lock. So that's just the concept I wanted to give you guys here. This is the concept of thread locks in Python. Okay. So that sounds pretty cool, right? So yeah, I think there's a timeout parameter in here. All right, hold on. Oh wait, it's in here. There's just something I wanted to mention is this timeout parameter in here. And the timeout parameter states that how long should I wait? Cause there might be some situations you run into where you, where a thread has to wait for a very, very long time. So what you can do instead is just say, wait for at most two seconds or five seconds, and then continue on. If the lock was not freed within that time period, it's not worth it. Don't wait, move on. So you can, you can actually say that. So you, just so you don't end, end up in some kind of eternal deadlock. So this is the end of the video. I hope you guys understood the concept of thread locks, how they work, why they're needed and how you can use them. If you guys, uh, enjoy this kind of content and want to see more, cause we have more content on threads coming out, then do subscribe to the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, let me know what you thought, and I'll see you guys in another video later.